<laughs> okay, so I think I've updated the I think I've updated Canvas for today through Wednesday. Um, today we're going to talk about the first first part um, physical basically physical properties of enantiomers. We've talked a little bit about Fisher projections and we'll come back to those as well as enantiomers and diastereomers on Wednesday. So I put a um, I put a video in the textbook and online as well as the PowerPoints I think. But I don't think there's any PowerPoints that go with it. I think it's all just freehand. Bobby? When are you going to start doing new grades so we know what we have? By Wednesday. Since midterm grades are due on Wednesday. I didn't get to them this weekend. But right now most of the grade is your exam. But it will be boosted up by what you've done in terms of the book problems. That's and the two take-home quizzes, which I'm grading. And now we're going on Wednesday. It's got to. It's got to in order for me to give the midterm grades. So, yeah, that that didn't get done this weekend. And it's, but it's got. Yeah, Wednesday's the absolute <laughs> deadline for that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about physical properties of enantiomers and then diastereomers and then some practical stuff. So, <coughs> so enantiomers have the same physical properties <coughs> except one. They've got the same boiling point, the same melting point. If you injected them into a GC, they would give a single peak unless you do something special, which I'll talk about later. And if you put them on a TLC, you would get one spot. So the only physical difference is their specific rotation. And that depends on how they interact with what's called plane polarized light. So first things first, what's plane polarized light? If you haven't had physics for a while, Basically, um, light comes as a wave, and that wave has two components that are basically perpendicular to each other, the electric, uh, electric vector and the magnetic vector. That's why it's called electromagnetic radiation. So when you look at the light, for instance, from these fluorescent lights, you're going to see all 360 degrees of those vectors. And plane polarized lights when we select just one orientation to allow through. So there's things called polarizing filters. If you have a good set of sunglasses, they're probably polarized lenses. And you can tell they're polarized lenses because if you look at the sky and you turn your head, it either becomes more darker or lighter blue because the light that comes off the atmosphere is polarized. Light that comes off the water when it reflects is polarized. So sometimes you'll see a shimmer when you have polarized lenses when you look at waves. And they put them on photography um, lenses. If you're going to shoot something, for instance, out in light, you might be shooting a picture of a car the light that bounces off the car is polarized, so you might want to, you know, there'd be a shiny part you might want to tone down. And so you can use the polarized lenses. So if you pass your light through a polarized filter, you will get <coughs> one orientation of the vector. Actually, one orientation of both of the vectors since they're perpendicular. That's plain polarized light. And that was known in the late 1800s um, before chirality was, before it was used for chirality. So if we pass plain polarized light through a solution of a single enantiomer, okay, so I'm going to talk 
first about the left and the right-hand pairs of molecules, regardless of how many chiral centers it has. There's just two. We talked about diastereomers last time. One molecule may have a number of diastereomers, but it has one single enantiomer. So when you pass flame polarized light through that solution, it will basically interact with it and it will cause the plane polarized light to rotate by a certain number of degrees that we call alpha. And the rotation can either be clockwise or counterclockwise. So, for instance, if it's if it rotates the light clockwise, that's the plus direction and we basically call that the D that stands for dextrorotary. So the D, the dextrorotary compound, is the one that rotates plane polarized light to the right. On the other hand, if the plane polarized light is rotated to the left, that's negative counterclockwise that's lever rotary. And so for the two enantiomers, in terms of their physical properties of how they rotate plane polarized light, you've got a D and an L form for dextro rotary, lever rotary, positive rotating negatively. And so each enantiomer can be described that way. But that's an experimental property. It's a physical property of the um, molecule. And then the geometric property would be the configuration around each chiral center, but I'm going to come to that. So the first thing is we, have, we can rotate plane polarized light. Well, that the amount of rotation in degrees is dependent on a number of things. First of all, it's dependent on the molecule you use. Because each molecule has a different, in theory, a different rotation, different number of degrees that it rotates, a different interaction with plane polarized light. But then the experimental things that can be different is that you could use a longer or shorter cell you could use more or less in terms of concentration. If you have a longer cell, the light has more interaction with the molecules, and so a longer cell will cause more rotation. A more concentrated sample, more molecules are interacting with the light, it will have a greater rotation. Just in simply in terms of that alpha term. And the solvent plays a little bit of a role, but it's not measurable in anything that we would do um, in lab or in lecture. And we're going to do, we're going to look at the optical activity um, or specific rotation of molecules later on in lab. Um, is there like people that would go through and standardize that? Yeah. Well, that's exactly what we need. So because these, because you, everybody could get a different observed rotation, we need a standardization. Because if I make a molecule and I say it has a rotation of 5 degrees, then somebody else could have it being 10 degrees if they used a longer, shorter cell or more concentrated. So we need to define something that is independent of these two experimental parameters. And so th that's what we do. And what we do is, well, let's see, if you double the if you double the cell length, you're gonna double the rotation. If you double the concentration, you're gonna double the concent or you're gonna double the rotation. So what we need is something called which we're gonna call specific rotation. So the specific rotation is alpha in brackets. The 20 whoa. The 20 stands for the temperature at which you make the measurement, and it's standard 20 degrees. The D is a very specific wavelength of light. 
that's called the D-line of sodium. Basically, if you have a sodium vapor lamp, which you might, that's not very common. It used to be more common because it used to be that street lights were sodium vapor lamps. They gave off kind of an orange glow. That's the very specific wavelength of light um, is due to the sodium. So you have to use a particular wavelength of light, and you've got to make the measurement at 20 degrees. So the specific rotation equals our observed rotation that we get from the instrument divided by L, which is the cell length, in decimeters, where one decimeter equals 10 centimeters. And most of these instruments, if they're, well, ours are set up, so that typically the cell lengths are about one decimeter because then that just makes the math easy. Um, there's, there's longer ones, there's two decimeter cells. Um, and then there's very small cells that are used for research grade instruments, which we don't have. C's concentration, and that's in grams per milliliter. And you might say, well, why would the concentration be in grams per milliliter? Why not something you know, more sophisticated like molar. Oftentimes we don't know what the material is, so we don't know its molecular weight. So we can we know what the concentration is if it's just grams per milliliter. Okay. So that those are the parameters, and if we now take into account the cell length and the concentration, everybody should get the same specific rotation for an enantiomer. And so now that specific rotation becomes a very specific physical property for a chiral molecule. Okay. All right. So you need to know this for the problems in Chapter 6. And we'll use this in two experiments in lab. We're going to use yeast to reduce a compound that will make an 85-15 roughly mixture of the two enantiomers, so we're going to measure its specific rotation to determine which of the two is the major component. And then we're going to take a leave tablets and we're going to get the naproxen sodium out of them. And the naproxen sodium is the sodium salt, so it's a carboxylic acid that's been deprotonated. That's the form it gets sold in. When it gets into your stomach, it becomes naproxen, the carboxylic acid. Those two compounds have different rotations. And so we're going to measure one, convert it to the other, and measure the second rotation. That's experiment 11. And the other one's experiment 10, the yeast. So we'll be working with this, but you also need to work with it in the textbook problems. All right. So that's specific rotation. And one of the things about specific rotation, or just the observed rotation, is that the terms, the D and the L terms, um, correspond to the enantiomers. Whether they have one chiral center or whether they have 20. Now, if you just had a single molecule that had a single chiral center as R and S, the one thing that there is no direct relationship between is D and L and R and S. And what I mean by that is some D compounds are R and some D compounds are S. The only way you know what the relationship is is to find it. So you make a molecule or you purify it so it's one single enantiomer. You take that enantiomer and determine whether it's D or L Using, the pol using an instrument called the polarimeter, which lets you determine how many degrees of rotation you have. But that doesn't tell you what the exact configuration of the molecule is. What you then have to do is take that molecule and slowly crystallize it so that you get what's called a perfect crystal. Now, you guys don't get perfect crystals in lab. Okay. As good as they look, they're not perfect. Perfect would be like the little cubes of salt from the salt shaker. They have to be regularly shaped, perfectly clear, 
And the way a solid state structure works is that if you imagine you have a, a shoebox and you put your molecule in it, like the little Tinker Toy models, and then you stack shoeboxes in all three dimensions with each shoebox containing another model in exactly the same positions as all the other shoeboxes. That's what a solid state structure looks like. It's very repetitive. It doesn't have to have a shoebox. It can have a shoebox with sides like this or like this. Well, mostly like this. But what you do is you take those perfect crystals, pass them through an x-ray beam, and when the x-ray beam comes through the crystal, it diffracts on the other side, so into a bunch of different small beams. And those small beams, their intensity and their geometry, and then you rotate the crystal a little bit and measure all the beams with some fairly sophisticated math, which is now all done by computers, you can put back together the structure. And you can determine exactly where the atoms are in three-dimensional space. In order to do R and S determination, you have to have an incredibly good crystal. Um, because it's not, I, I, I've never done that analysis. I spent two years doing x-ray crystallography as a postdoc. And we never had to do that because I don't know how we would have done it. I mean, there's standardized methods for it, but it's you have to have a really, really good crystal to be able to do that. When I was a graduate student at Duke, the um, crystallographer was this older Scottish guy. And he had, like, his professors in Scotland were the original professors that came up with X-ray diffraction, which is how structures are determined. Every single cartoon picture of a protein or a DNA molecule you see in... Uh, in a biology textbook, came from one of these perfect crystals. So, and then, you know, DNA, they won the Nobel Prize for the X-ray structure of DNA. But he, he was amused by the fact that as an organic chemist, I was going to go to postdoc in X-ray crystallography. So he gave me some hints along the way. And it just showed me how difficult it was to determine RNS because he would get samples from pharmaceutical companies that needed to know if their drug was RRS. And oftentimes he would get them and they'd already have determined it was R and it was actually S. So he would have to correct them. And he was he was the person that did the crystallography on Taxol, which I think I've shown you is a big, is a big um, got 20 atoms in a ring. And it's at the time it wasn't it wasn't as important. It was just starting to enter trials for being a cancer drug. Now it's routinely used. So he had done a lot of these things, and determining RNS is not trivial by any stretch of the imagination. So my point is there's no relationship between DNL and RNS. That has to be made by taking a D molecule and diffracting it. But if you're going to make a chiral drug and you're going to take it to the FDA for approval, you need to know it's DRL and it's RRS. So there's lots of these that, that have to be made in those perfect crystalline forms to be able to determine RRS. Bob? Is DNL the, um, like in the equation the DNL? So DNL is whether or not your specific rotation is negative or positive. If it's negative, it's lever rotary. If it's positive, it's D, it's dextro rotary. So DNL is the physical property. That's how the molecule interacts with plane polarized light. And DNL has been along has been around for a long time. And I'll tell you another story. So the DNL came from Louis Pasteur, right? The guy that invented milk. See, when I told that joke when I first started teaching at Kansas State. The smoking crew outside the building had to had to stop me and tell me that he didn't really invent milk. And I said, I know that. It was just a little joke. They told me some of the other things he did. But and he did a lot of stuff. But he did do he was involved in chirality. So he's in France. Wine's big in France. 
And in the bottle, the, the corks of the bottles, if you open them up, you sometimes find crystals. And those crystals, when you looked at them under the microscope, actually had a left and a right-handed forms. You could look at them and they were mirror images of each other. So the legend is that he painstakingly separated them out with tweezers into two piles, and he knew about plain polarized light from previous people that had done work in physics. And so he made solutions and he passed the plain polarized light through them. And what he found was that one mirror image rotated positively, one mirror image rotated negatively, and when he mixed them together in equal proportions, no rotation, zero. So that led to the idea that a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers is called a racemic mixture. And a racemic mixture has a zero degree optical rotation. And I use the word optical rotation and specific rotation. I use them interchangeably. And it makes sense. Basically, they cancel each other out. Now, along the way, I, I think the term racemic, and I haven't looked this up, but I think there's another, there's another crystal that came out of the quarks as well. And it was called racemic acid. It's actually tartaric acid. And, but they called it racemic acid because its shape had a mirror plane that could be passed right through the molecule. So the molecule is not a chiral. And so when you put that in water, it has zero degree rotation. It's what's called a meso compound that we'll talk about on Wednesday, if we didn't already start to talk about it last week. Okay. So racemic mixture is a 50-50 mixture that has a zero degree rotation. So we have D, we have L, we have a way of, of determining the specific rotation. What else can we do? Well, here's the, here's the naproxen sodium molecule that's in an Aleve tablet. And with this naproxen sodium, basically this, this whole group is a C double bond O with an O minus with Na plus as the counter ion for the salt. This is the chiral center, which is the carbon that's attached to the methyl hydrogen the carboxylic acid, and then the naphthalene ring. So if you take in the leaf tablet, this is what you're taking, the sodium salt. When the sodium salt hits your stomach, it gets protonated to form the carboxylic acid. But one of the forms of a leaf, the one that's going to take care of your pain or your headache, is one form. It's the actually, it's the L form. Unfortunately, the D form has some kidney toxicity issues. So when they make this molecule, they have to show that it's 99.999999% L with no D in it. And my, maybe by the end of the semester, you'll have an appreciation for the fact that that carbon with the CH, that cannot undergo any kind of reaction so it'll stay intact in your body. So it's not like your body's going to metabolize the D, metabolize the L into the D. So they have to show that, the, that they have pure L. All right. So oftentimes what we do is we use the optical rotation to determine what's called the enantiomeric excess. And the enantiomeric excess is just a term that says, okay, that percentage is the percentage of the major isomer minus the percentage of the minor isomer. It's the excess one is of the other. For example, if you had a 75%, 25% mixture, it would be 50% in, in antimeric excess. The sign of the major component 
would be the sign of the mixture. And what I mean by that is if the majority of the component was D, that means the solution would have a positive rotation. If a majority of the mixture was L, then it would have a negative rotation. Okay. And when I last looked for the specific rotation of naprax and sodium, I found that it was anywhere from minus 15.3 to minus 17, de 17 degrees, which is, a, which is a range, which is kind of troubling because I would expect it to be an exact number. But I also, I also interpret this to mean that with, a, with measuring the optical rotation of the specific rotation, there's a lot of error. And so that number can only be measured so precisely, which I'll come back to. Okay. So the enantiomeric excess can be used, although it's not nowadays. It could be used to determine the percentage of enantiomers in a mixture. For example, let's assume that the naproxen sodium is minus 16, somewhere between minus 15 and minus 17. And let's say I had a mixture that rotated minus 12. How do I determine the percentages of the two components? Well, the first thing I have to go back to is, the, is this idea that the enantiomeric excess, when I had a 75-25 mixture, the 25% of the one enantiomer canceled out 25% of the other enantiomer leaving 50% in excess. So when you, look at these, when you look at these equations, you want the percentage of D, well, in this case, the, the major component is going to be L because it's a negative. The solution has a negative rotation. That means the major component is the L, is the L minus component. So in this case, the percentage of L minus the percentage of D is going to give us the percent in antiomeric excess. But the percentage of L plus the percentage of D must equal 100%. So what I now have is I now have, a, a, I have two equations and two unknowns, which I could solve by many methods. The simplest method is just simply add them together. So if I add them together, I get two percentages of L equals 100 plus the percent plus the enantiomeric excess percentage. And that is more generalized. It would be two times the percentage of the major component is equal to 100 plus the percent of an antimeric excess. And you'll have to do this for one of the lab, for one of the lab um, equations and I think some problems in the book. So if you want to just solve two equations and two unknowns, go for it. I'd use the linear algebra method of um, where they have those two things with the dimension, or I forget what they're called. You got the two lines and then you have like a matrix in between. That's a cool way of solving two equations and two unknowns. But anyway, the, this is what you're going to use. So in this case, what we would have is we would have that the percentage of the L enantiomer equals 100 plus 12 over 16 over 2. That's how I would solve that equation. Where are you getting 2% alpha? Because when I added these two equations up, I get minus D and plus D cancel, and, and percentage L plus percentage L makes 2 times the percentage of L. Okay. So if I solve this equation, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think it's like 87 and a half and 12 and a half. Now, I only remember that from this morning when I did it. But there's an easier, there's an easier method to look at this.
so, so how did you get the two percent? Uh, Take these two equations and add them up. So percent L plus percent L makes two percent L, two times percent L. The percent D minus percent D is cancels. And then a hundred plus percent E. So all I'm doing is I'm just adding these two equations together. And then over here, the percent in antimeric excess is going to be 12. Actually, it's 12 over 16 times 100. So that'll give you the exact number. The way I like to do this sometimes is I like to think about, okay, what's 12, what is 12 over 16? 12 over 16 is what? 75%, right? Because ultimately it's 3 over 4. Right? This, is the, this is the skill that you can have. If you understand basic math, you can do it in your head. And nowadays you'll look like a sheer genius. Right? If you go 12 over 16, that's 75%. And people will be amazed. Because they couldn't even get their calculator out fast enough to do that. Right? And, right? How many times how many times has Faith talked about estimating your answers so that you don't give like an answer of 150 when it was like two? Right? So anyway, I digress. 75% is the enantiomeric excess. So what I need is I need two numbers that add up to a hundred, but when they're subtracted equal seventy-five. Because that's what these two equations tell us. So the way I did it this morning was I started with 90, 10. And 90, 10, 90 minus 10 is 80, too high. How about 85, 15? And 85, 15 is what, 70? So when you hone in on this, you end up with 87 and a half and 12 and a half. And that gives you 75% in antimeric excess. So if you don't want to deal with equations, you can sort of repetitively hone in on that answer non-mathematically. So there's technically no way to not have just even the slightest amount of the other one? In there is. But then you're going to have an enantiomeric excess of 99.9999% pure. And it's just so small that they just don't count it. Well, I'm going to come back to that because you have, no, you have no choice but to count it. How you detect it's a whole other story. Because what we find with, with specific rotation, it's not sensitive enough to get to that level. And the drug companies have to prove to the FDA. And if you're an ethical drug company... And you're making a compound that where one enantiomer causes liver toxicity or kidney, in this case it's kidney toxicity, you don't want that in your drug, right? If you're an ethical company, you don't, well, I'm just saying, if you, you don't want that. So you've got to somehow show that you don't have any in there. And any is a bad word, right? Because that involves zero. And to a chemist, there is no zero. There's just below the, whatever the detection limits is. But we don't use specific rotation anymore to determine anything other than a gross percent in the antimeric excess. The kind, of, the kind that drug companies are looking for is nine plus, 99 plus percent. And that's not accomplishable by optical rotation. So there's got to be another method. Wait, so like in the bottom part when we did the calculation, the percent and antiomeric excess is the major divided by the minus? It's the, ro it's the specific rotation of the mixture divided by the pure, the specific rotation of the pure. Oh. That's what the antiomeric excess is. So the percent, so percent and antiomeric excess is equal to the is equal to the rotation of the mixture over the rotation of the pure times 100. 
I just don't get where did you get twelve point five from? Because one of the because it has to be two numbers that add up to a hundred, but when you subtract them make seventy five. So the if I solved for this equation for the percent L, that's gonna be eighty seven point five. And then if I want to know the percent D, it's simply gonna be a hundred minus the percent L. So I have Wait, so it has to add up to be 75? It has to add up to be 100, okay. but then subtract that they have to equal 75. Okay. So that's the combination if I just did it in my head. A couple of iterations. <clears throat> so your book is going to ask you some questions like this. So you're, gonna, you're always going to have two numbers? Yes. An answer. Yes. And whether it's D or L is dependent on the sign of the mixture. So if the mixture sign is negative, you're going to have more L than D, and vice versa. Okay, so polarimet polarimetry, looking at the optical rotation, looking at the percent in antimeric excess is not going to be good enough. It, it's good enough for us in lab, it's not good enough for drug development if you're going to make a chiral molecule. Okay. Particularly if you're making something like thalidomide where the other, the small enantiomer, the one that you don't want, is going to have such devastating effects if it's there. Aleve, okay, a little bit of kidney toxicity. You don't want that there, but it's not like what thalidomide did. But in order to get this approved as a drug by the FDA, you have to basically show it's completely pure. So how do you get to that? And if you were going to make that enantiomer in the lab, you'd have to have a method to make it. Or if you made it in a mixture, you have to have some method to separate enantiomers. But you can't separate enantiomers because enantiomers have exactly the same physical properties, except how they rotate plane polarized light, and I have yet to see anybody use that to separate components. Our typical <coughs> separation, our TLC plate, column chromatography, gas chromatography, something like that. So in order to separate enantiomers, we have to talk about diastereomers. Well, diastereomers are completely different molecules. And remember what a diastereomer is. Diastereomer has at least one chiral center of the same configuration, at least one chiral center opposite. Those are the diastereomers. Diastereomers are different compounds. I can shoot them into a GC, I'll see two peaks. Put them in a column, get two, get two test tubes full. Put it on TLC, TC two spots. So here's an example from um, somewhat recent past. Pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine has this configuration for the carbon attached to the OH and then the one attached to the methyl group. Pseudoephedrine is what you go to the drugstore, you buy it behind the counter. Um, with the pharmacist, you can only buy 3.6 grams a day. Otherwise, you're in violation of the Methamphetamine Act, Control Act. And both of these can be precursors to methamphetamines, which who would ever thought today that when people would go, oh, meth, not, no problem, because of what's going on with opiates, right? Opiates have made meth seem like, you know, alcohol abuse. But it's still a problem, and you still are restricted. Ephedrine is its diastereomer. This chiral center is the same. This chiral center is opposite. So in this case, one was the same, and one has the opposite configuration. Exactly what a diastereomer is. You can see from their melting points, they have different melting points. If you shoot them into a GC, you'll see two peaks. I can guarantee you somewhere in the U.S., some crime lab is shooting these things into the GC as part of a methamphetamine ex ex active, or uh, as a methamphetamine um, investigation. And ephedrine you can't buy anymore because ephedrine was in diet, weight loss supplements. 
Both of these cause uh, an accelerated heartbeat to the point where your heart just doesn't beat anymore, and that's never a good thing. Um, if, so ephedrine causes your metabolism to speed up, you to lose weight, and eventually die. So it's no longer, you can't buy it, probably from some foreign, some, some foreign pharmacy. But they have different physical properties. So how do you separate enantiomers? What you have to do is you've got to turn those enantiomers into diastereomers. Then you can separate them, and then after you separate them, you do something to get back your enantiomers. And the classical method of this is what's called Mosher esters. So Mosher came up with this idea to separate different chiral alcohols. And so what we have is we have a carboxylic acid attached to a chiral carbon of one enantiomeric form. You react that with a chiral, with both enantiomers of a chiral alcohol and you make the ester. In that ester, these two chiral centers are opposite because they started out opposite, and this chiral center is the same. So you now have turned your chiral alcohols that you couldn't separate into two diastereomeric esters that you can separate. And so you can pass these through a column, like we're doing this week in lab, you could pass these, put them on a TLC plate, separate them into two spots. So you can now separate your chiral alcohols as esters. The problem is, how do you get them back? And if you want them back, what you need to do is to add base to the ester. We'll learn about this reaction next semester. This is called hydrolysis. And so the ester will hydrolyze. It'll reform your carboxylic acid and your alcohol. You had two chiral esters and two different test tubes. Hydrolyze them. Now you have the two chiral alcohols separated from each other. And so this is a classical separation using what are called Mosher esters. But the key thing is we have to turn enantiomers into diastereomers. That's the basic that's the basic key element in separating an antimers. So let's talk a little bit here about some practical stuff. What? Did you say we have to turn dia di Stereomers into enantiomers the other way around. You've got to turn enantiomers into diastereomers. And then be able to regenerate those enantiomers after you've separated them. Now, I'll show you, some ex I'll show you a couple examples here from um, some of the stuff that I've had students do with essential oils using gas chromatography and mass spectrometry, which you'll learn about next semester. But there's one particular component in a number of essential oils that has a chiral center. It's called linalool. It has a chiral center, so it exists as R and S or as D and L. And so when linalool, when it's made in these two different enantiomeric forms, they have two different smells. They have two different fragrances. The three R, the R, and the L form is flowery, fresh, and lavender-like. And the S and D is herbaceous, musty green, having a citric note. Now, the problem with fragrances is there is no physical representation of a fragrance. Although I don't know why that's the case, because if I run a GC mass spec on them, I can make a physical representation. But I guess it just depends on the instrument that I use. You can't pat, you can't trademark, you can't patent a fragrance. You can patent its composition, but you can't patent its aroma. 
And the reason why is because there's no physical description of it. There's lots of nice words like this, but there's no physical descriptors. Now, on the other hand, you can copyright music because there's notes on a page that make up that music. So this is the whole problem with fragrance and with perfumes and colognes, is that it's kind of a wild west. Because there is, there, you have to keep all of this stuff as corporate secrets. Or if you're like the Chanel company, you basically like own your own special places, flowers that you get your raw materials from. So you control your, you control your raw materials incredibly closely, as well as the as well as the formulations. So one of the experiments that they do in instrumental analysis lab that I originally developed was the idea of looking at the percentage of linalool in all these different um, these different um, essential oils. So this was like 10 years ago. The internet wasn't quite what it was. There wasn't a Amazon. You couldn't go to Amazon and get 50 billion essential oils. You had to order them directly from the manufacturers. So I did, and what I found was the four biggest linalool percentage was whole leaf, whole wood, which comes from a tree in China, rosewood, which comes from the South America, and rosewood is very controversial because it's you don't want to be chopping down the rainforest to get all of the rosewood oil or the rosewood to make guitar frets out of or guitar um, things out of. And then coriander. So you can see they have different percentages. With the whole leaf, it's not 109.3. You can't have over 100%. That's just an error. So how do you determine what linalool, whether you have RRS or DRL? Well, you use a special gas chromatography column. What they do is you take the column and you actually make it out of a single enantiomer of a molecule called cyclodextrin. So that when the racemic mixture of linalool goes through the column, sometimes it's interacting with a plus cyclodextrin, while sometimes the plus linalool is reacting with the plus cyclodextrin in terms of its interaction, and sometimes the negative is interacting with the cyclodextrin. I just made diastereomers on the column. So that means those two enantiomers will interact differently with the column. And so if you take and you inject a racemic mixture of linalool, you get two peaks, R and S. Hopefully they're 50-50. I don't know. That doesn't necessarily look like they're 50-50, but it looks like they're pretty close. Then you buy the R minus pure, and you shoot it in, and you see there's the R peak. But it ain't pure because there's a little teeny tiny S peak there. Now, drug discovery, this is how we're going to get down to 99.9 .9 and point another 9 and another 9 is by using this technique until we can't measure that peak anymore. And so this is how they measure the enantiomeric access in drugs is used chiral GC, is to use a chiral GC column. So then you can start looking at the compositions of these different oils. The whole leaves and whole woods always turn out to be 100%. They're better than the stuff I bought that was 100%. There's no second peak. The rosewood oil is always, sometimes it's plus, sometimes it's minus. It's always right around 50-50, but it's never perfectly 50-50. If it's perfectly 50-50, somebody's dumped synthetic linalool into your rosewood oil, which is called adulteration, which is bad. And then coriander is always more positive. So you could use this chiral GC in order to take a look at all these different um, essential oils and basically authenticate them. And on occasion, we would find, for instance, like the aromatherapy outlet was 98.9% R, which is not possible for rosewood. And so they somehow have some whole leaf oil in there. Now, I don't call them up and say, did you know that you're selling an adulterated product? Because my legal team doesn't think that's a good idea. <laughs> I did one time when I was showing this to an undergraduate student. She did blurt out, I wonder how my mother's company 
is on that list? And I said, oh, your mother's company, what would that be? And it was one of the ones that was okay. But then she ended wor up working on this, on this project. Her mother sold wholesale um, essential oils in the greater Cleveland area, and so we, were, we did some stuff with lavender. And the idea here is that nowadays we can determine RNS percentages very accurately using a chiral GC. Okay. All right, so on Wednesday, we will talk more about enantiomers and diastereomers, do some problems. That means that if we end Chapter 6 on Wednesday, that the problems from the book reading as well as the other problems won't be due until a week from today, the Monday. So you should probably still be plugging away at them, but they won't be due for another week. All right. If you have questions, as always, email me. Okay, let me just stop the recording.